one. There it is. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this beautiful Wednesday. We have an awesome guest, another awesome guest lined up for y'all today. We're going to be talking borderline personality disorder. Going to be a good conversation, so tune in. Let's get at it. Practicing polyamory. Real life perspectives from the imperfect people of polyamory. The mission of the Practicing Polyamory podcast is to provide a platform for all of the real-life, flawed humans that practice polyamory so that we might all learn from one another and grow as a community. Enjoy the show. All right, all right, we are back. It is a beautiful Wednesday. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Today, before we jump in chat with today's awesome guest, I want to quickly remind everybody everybody to please follow the show on all social media platforms, especially Facebook and Instagram. That's where I'm most active. Uh, but please subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, wherever it is that you download podcasts. You can find us everywhere at Practicing Poly A. And remember that following and sharing is a free, easy way to support the show. As always, I want to remind you that if you are listening to this podcast, you are a welcome guest to be on the show. We are here to share stories, and I want to get as many voices as possible to speak here because I know that the more stories we hear, the more representation we'll have, the more others will see us in themselves, and the more we can strengthen our community. So go to practicingpolyamory.com and sign up today. All right, everybody. That's my spiel. Now to the best part of the show, introducing today's guest. Today's guest is one of the real people of polyamory who's been practicing polyamory for nearly two decades. While, unbeknownst to them, borderline personality disorder was lurking in the background for the majority of their life. Now, the subject of neurodivergency is nothing new to our guest, as they've spent years and years assisting the parents of special needs children's, children while they navigate the world of individual education plans. Our guest is passionate about being a voice for those children, finding fulfillment in uplifting them however they can. When they're not busily researching and learning more about BPD and polyamory, our guest enjoys showing appreciation to loved ones by making thoughtful, handcrafted gifts. So as a true polyamorist, they're a lover of people. If you are or are with someone who's also navigating borderline personality disorder, our guest has a message of hope to share and reassurance that it's not all doom and gloom. So tune in. Joining us today from the Buckeye State, welcome to the show, Stacy Gatchet. <laughs> All right, producer man is on it today. Stacy, Stacy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So I want to hear your story. Um, let's see. Do we start with, you know what? Let's go ahead and jump right into BPD. I know absolutely pretty much zilch. I, I don't know anything about it. So give me the basics of what borderline personality disorder is, what it, and you know, how, how it affects your life. Um, let me see here. Um, it does like you have difficulty with your self esteem issues. Um, probably the biggest thing is the inability to manage emotions, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a borderline, you know, like, you may experience a disappointment, just, yeah, it's a disappointment and move on. For somebody with BTP, BPD or borderline, it's magnified a hundred times. Like, mm. it's just like an internal explosion. There's a, extreme mood swings, um, inappropriate intense anger, mm. um, loss of contact with reality feelings of emptiness probably uh the biggest thing that too that will is the lack of identity mm. um you kind of try to basically morph into whoever you're around or with to make them like you um interesting yeah um that's probably one of the biggest things there there's like nine characteristics and i hit all nine of them <laughs> um yay me i just got diagnosed in march so i've like really, really dove into new. to it um and it's really is caused by extreme trauma mm -hmm. um 
lack of attachment as a child, you know, um, it, it does create a pattern of unstable relationships. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a paranoia that goes with it. So like even being here, like signing up to be a guest on this, like I had this paranoia of like, Oh, mm -hmm. this is stupid. Like nobody really wants to hear about this. Like he's not going to want, you, you know, there's that running dialogue of mm -hmm. like, nobody really cares or something. Right. Um, totally feel that. I totally feel that it's a, uh, for me, it it's, it's imposter syndrome. It's this yeah. idea that, you know, who am I to mm -hmm. be speaking on any of these things? Um, right. But, you know, for me, in this case, it's it's about creating community. It's about, you know, you right. are not the only polyamorous person with borderline personality disorder. And so exactly. what this does is it gives an opportunity for somebody to connect and yes. say, oh, that's me. Yeah, so and that's, that's what I was noticing in some of the poly groups that I was in. Um, I was noticing so many of them saying like, yeah, I have BTP P borderline and this person and this person. And then I can't remember how I got in touch with your mm -hmm. podcast. Like you may have commented on something mm -hmm. I posted on in one of those groups or something. Remember that I went and like, I was listening to, to the podcast. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. And then you're saying like, be anybody could be a guest. And I was like, well, there's so many of them out there. Like somebody needs to be a voice. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's exactly. So thank you again for being that voice for, for your bravery, for having the courage to come on here uh, and share your story. I believed in you for a long time. Okay. Believed in you for a long time. Uh, one of the things that you, that you mentioned is uh, you know, with BPD, it could cause a series of, um, uh, what did you, how did you say it? Uh, uh, relationships, just not unstable. lasting unstable relationships. Yeah. Thank you. But you have been with your husband for 19 years. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. Or maybe yeah. longer. I mean, practicing polyamory yeah. for 19 years. Um, no, we have been together. It's actually, what's today? The second, it's actually a couple of days from the anniversary of our first date 19 years ago. Um, so yeah, we've been together 19 years, been married for 18 and I came into it like, so when we first started dating, he'd said, well, I'm dating other people. And I was like, well, yeah, isn't that what normal people do at the beginning? Like mm -hmm. you're not, whereas well, you're getting to know them, you're dating other people too. And we dated probably about four months or so. And then I moved in with them and I thought, okay. you know, that follows, you know, the monogamy of, you date. So now it's serious. And probably about mm -hmm. a month after I moved in, he, I, he sat me down. He's like, I am going to date other people. I was like, Whoa, wait a minute. What is going on here? Hold it up. took me a minute to, to wrap my brain around it. Um, but he, like, we talked about it and I was like, you know, honestly, I've never tr been truly monogamous in any relationship. I've hmm. kind of always stepped out of just about any relationship I've been in since high school. Um, so, you know, back then, like we didn't know what it was. And I think we kind of started off with, it was kind of more of like swingers, mm -hmm. but it, that really wasn't enough for either one of us. We're both, right. both of us are like, we like that connection with people and. Yep. Um, yep. Totally feel that. Totally resonate. So, um, but it, we have like had our ups and downs with it. You know, it's mostly because of my, my borderline that we didn't know it caused like this extreme jealousy and fear of abandonment and um, everything. So it was very difficult. Um, and it hasn't been until like this past year um, like we've raised six kids, you know, it's hard mm -hmm. to date with the kids and everything within this last year. So like we've actually learned the term polyamory. So we're like, yes, that's what. Oh, just in the are. last year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we're, we're kind of, we've spent the last 19 years raising kids. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we're kind of sheltered. Um, and then 
you know, he's really come out of his shell and he started dating somebody. What's funny is that person, she's also borderline and she recognized oh. it in me. And that's what kind of led for me to be able to get diagnosed. Interesting. Whoa. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So through throughout those 19 years, uh, you were living with borderline, didn't really know it. Um, were you guys, were you and your husband uh, dating other people throughout those 19 years as well? Um, we, yeah, he kind of dated a few. Um, I dated a little bit. Um, like I said, for a while, it was almost more like swingers. Um, mm -hmm. And my emotional instability did really make it kind of difficult for him to be mm -hmm. able to date. Um, at one point, which is common with borderline, I was misdiagnosed as bipolar. Um, so that was fun being treated for bipolar. Those medications mm -hmm. did not work or anything. Um, mm -hmm. So it hasn't been. And then, you know, me mental illness and neurodivergent is like nothing new for our family. Like my youngest son, he's Asperger's. And mm -hmm. bipolar, we've the, we've run the gamut with the kids. So we spent a lot of time dealing with the kids that didn't really leave much time for dating. And so probably within the last two years. Got it. Got it. No, the reason I was asking was uh, if that you said that that before you and your husband got together, that you know neither one of you were really quite monogamous. And so I was wondering if that had you know if continuing down that non-monogamous path kind of helped with the BPD, but it didn't sound like it. It sounded like it actually, if ever he was dating, that it exacerbated mm -hmm. uh, those symptoms and kind of made things worse. Yes. Yeah. Got it. So another thing that you said was, uh, and and I hope that you can speak to this. Um, oh, thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> um, another thing that you said was that you were misdiagnosed with bipolar. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you and, and feel free to say, I don't really know. Um, but what's the difference between borderline and bipolar? Borderline cannot be treated with medication. Ah. Bipolar is a set of symptoms that can be treated with medications along with therapy. Bipolar can, or borderline. It's you just have intense therapy to treat. You can't, treat the borderline got it now the depression and anxiety that kind of goes along with it sometimes you can treat that with medication but mm -hmm. yeah got it so uh bipolar is maybe a chemical imbalance yeah, yeah whereas much. borderline is more how would you say it mm -hmm. i'd probably say more of like a a processing um, in the brain of events, an emotion, uh, emotional, emotional. It's a lack of emotional regulation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not it's, from a, but it's not from a chemical imbalance. It's just something no, else. It's, yeah. It's kind of like basically the processing of your brain being um, damaged from trauma it's kind of the same along the same lines as like what happens with PTSD mm -hmm. in that sense with borderline. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, I don't, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious, but I don't want to dig into like what, what kind of trauma might cause, like feel free to not share your personal story if you don't want to. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I, in um, for, for me, it was basically um, the abandonment by my, mom when I was younger I was reading oh, which one is it that I read it in that I could almost pinpoint the exact point of when this would have happened I think it was I can't remember if it was in polysecure or oh, the, I hate you don't leave I, me where they I think it was I I hate you don't leave me there was a point where they where the brain starts a development that secure attachment like to be away and know that they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. The problem was that at the most crucial time of about that 18 month um, period, 
my my brother was born and then by mm -hmm. the time i was two because i'm the oldest by the time i was two my parents divorced i wasn't really wanted by my mom my mom didn't really want a girl so mm -hmm. at that crucial time of where i would have been developing that secure attachment of knowing like people go away and come back i i had like my mom going away and not really coming back mm -hmm. um so and then it just that just continued a pattern of continued abandonment by her throughout my years and then um being raised by my aunt who was undiagnosed uh bipolar at the time it was like a real chaotic environment that i grew up in and not seeing how relationships really truly work got it so that kind of trauma the 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 attachment there the insecure attachment avoidant mm -hmm. attachment um not sure which one uh necessarily applies but it sounds like you've been doing a lot of reading on that yeah. attachment theory yeah yeah. Can you tell me what you've learned about attachment theory and how it applies to you uh, with your uh, borderline? Um, yeah, with your border I'm still kind of like in the dark with it because it's hard for... See, I didn't think about the attachment theory, so... Oh, it's it's I, a tough I subject, so don't, don't feel bad at all. Yeah, I didn't like write notes about like... So I can't really remember where I was at because when I was reading Polysecure, which I haven't finished yet, I'm like half, I have like four it's different books. Started, so that's <laughs> the biggest issue there. Um, so I can't really, it's been a, a while. So unless I take notes, sometimes I, my brain. No worries. Yeah, no worries. No worries. I was, uh, I was just kind of going off the cuff there seeing, uh, yeah. seeing what, what you might remember from, from that. Uh, Cause I did uh, listen to, Poly Secure. Uh, I'm an audiobook guy, and um, yeah, my husband is too. It, it it's great, but man, that is one book that gets so deep into a lot of these subjects. And I listened to it twice, and I still didn't fully understand it. And I'm like barely remembering the term, like insecure. insecure. Say, yeah, yeah. Hold I... up. Wait a minute. Exactly. <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot, what did I read? Yeah. What did I just hear? So. Great. Uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff that goes into that. Um, but all of the other research that you've done, you've got some notes there. Uh, tell me about some of the things that you have learned uh, that you would like to share with anybody else who has borderline. Um, well, first off, you're not really crazy. <laughs> I know that <laughs> I feel, I, I would just feel like, like I didn't know what, what was going on um, with myself. And it's been, it's been kind of eye opening since having the diagnosis. It's almost like, okay, now I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, another one of the biggest markers of borderline is the black and white thinking. It's either all good or all bad. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in the borderline community, there's a term called favorite person, which unfortunately my poor husband is. And you do not, it's not, uh, it sounds like, oh yeah, favorite person. No, if you're a borderline's favorite person, you, you're going to need just as much help as they do to mm. break that B favorite person bond. Because one minute you're idealizing them, they're up on a pedestal, they're perfect, they can do no wrong. But the minute mm -hmm. that they say or do something wrong, then it is all hell has broke loose. They are nothing but all bad. Uh, I don't know how many times, probably just in the last couple of months that I was like, we're getting divorced. You're moving out. I'm taking your name off the deed of the house. So you can't have it like just, and it would be over some, something stupid. Um, one of the biggest things I've learned too, though, is there is, there is treatment to help. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest one that I've, use is dialectical behavior treatment or DBT, which the main core of that is mindfulness, learning mm -hmm. to be mindful, be present in the moment to help, you know, check your facts, help. It, it, it helps you stop with that black and white thinking. Mm -hmm. The 
I started this in group therapy, the dialectical thinking. And one of the first things I said was, was that with dialectical, dialectical thinking, two things can be true at the same time. And I'm like, listen, what? somebody is smoking something somewhere because that, you know, <laughs> that's not possible. It's either this or this. Um, so that has been really eye opening to figure out the gray thinking, you know, like, yeah, mm. somebody may have hurt my feelings, but that doesn't mean that they're still aren't the good person that I think that they are. And I've started something new. It's called EMDR, eye movement desensitization, desensitization and reprocessing. And what mm -hmm. it does is it uses eye movement or my therapist, she uses tapping because it's, she, she can't just sit here and do this all day, make you move your eyes. But if you tap with your eyes closed, it causes that connection between the right brain and left brain. And what it does is it helps you reprocess the trauma. So you remember it, but you don't have that feeling like it's the day that it happened when you do remember it. You're not constantly in that fight or flight mo mode. You can be like, yes, that happened to me, but everything's okay now. And what does that do when you bring that trauma back? Um, I have heard, because I've literally have just started this. Uh, usually after each session for like a day or two, it's really, really tough emotionally. Mm -hmm. But then after that, after you get through those first couple of days after each session, it, get, it just gets easier and easier. It's like, okay, you brought it to the front. You've had, it, it's almost like that last hurrah for your intense mo emotions with it. Got it. So it's it's giving you that opportunity to process it from a healthier place, which is right. where you are now, as mm -hmm. opposed to when that trauma actually occurred. Right, right. Super yeah. interesting, super cool stuff. So, you know, as, as you're as you're talking about this and as you're uh, explaining what happens when you have I'm going to refer to it as an episode. Um, yeah. You. You kind of lose yourself, it sounds like. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that you said was that there's not a medication necessarily to um, to deal with this. How, how do you how do you like bring yourself back? Um, your your husband, your favorite person, is he does he help you to say, hey, look, you're like, here's a sign. Right. This, this is happening yeah. right now. Um, take a moment to step back. How, how, how does that work? Um, it, it depends on how deep into the episode I'm in, but mm -hmm. for the most part, yeah, he can be like, you're having, you're having a borderline moment. This is, you know, a borderline moment. Him being my favorite person, it's hard for me to listen to him. Mm -hmm. Um, his, his, um, girlfriend he's seeing now, the one that noticed the signs of me who's borderline, she's easier to talk to because she, like I can hear it from her better. Like I can yeah. tell her stuff and she'd be like, this is a borderline moment. And she's had the DPT and stuff. So she can be like, I think this is a time to check your facts or to have an opposite action oh. moment or, you know, stuff like that, that can help. And I'm more likely to listen to her. Cause I'm like, okay, you know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with him, I'm like, so into the emotion that I'm like, you don't even know what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. I'll tend to feel like, when he does that, that he, I'm like, you only see me as borderline and you can't see that I could be right about something or, you know, it, it, it gets to be really, um, really difficult. And the funny thing is, is that most therapists will only take on two borderline patients because taking on one's like taking on five patients, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. taking on one borderline. And, um, <laughs> um, he, his therapist said, now you have two women in your life that are borderline. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I totally, you know, I, I totally get, um, not wanting to listen to your favorite person, to your spouse. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to just say, no, 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 you're just, you're just saying that, but that third party, thank you, polyamory, right? In yes. this case, uh, exactly. 
really, really brings that out. So uh, Jeremy was asking to talk more about the traits of BPD. Can you tell me okay. some more of, of the traits maybe? Um, so there are nine characteristics that they use to diagnose borderline with. And in order to get diagnosed, you have to have, you have to exhibit five of these nine traits, which I actually exhibit all nine. One of them is like the chronic feeling of emptiness, um, emotional instability in reaction to day-to-day -day events, uh, <clears throat> frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment. Um, and that, that one plays a big part in our polyamory. Um, mm -hmm. So his, um, his girlfriend, Tracy, we used to call them triggers, but she didn't like the word trigger and I kind of didn't either. So we started calling them activations, our activations, the things that activate our borderline. Um, you know, sometimes him just going over there, like I'll think like she, she you know, part, part of being polyamorous is to be able to connect with people and not knowing like not the emotional needs of one isn't the, his um, all of his emotional needs aren't rested solely on me. Right. But it can activate me because I'm like, oh, he needs somebody else and I'm not doing enough type thing. So it's kind of a. Uh, it's like that jealousy, like an even extreme and a more extreme version of jealousy. Yes. Yes. Um, the fourth one is unstable self and image or a sense of self, um, lack of identity. Again, that's where you're going to do and say things and kind of morph yourself into the people around you that you feel you want to fit in with and like, um, which again, my therapist, the first thing she asked, you know, with the borderline, she's like, is polyamory really something that you you wanted to do is that really you or is that something you know at the beginning of the relationship you wanted him to accept you and love you so you said that you would do it type mm -hmm. thing um i will admit at the beginning i was like uh yeah i want him to love and accept me but after 19 years it makes sense and i really mm -hmm. feel that th that's it's me you know right one thing i was sure about um <laughs> uh the fifth one, impulsive behavior, usually in at least two areas that can be self-damaging. So this could be anything from gambling, overeating, drugs, just anything that is going to be harmful to yourself, either physically or, you know, self-sabotaging, basically. Um, right. uh, honestly, for me one of my self um one of my impulsive behaviors was um sex using to me sex was acceptance so mm -hmm. i gave it away way too freely wanting people to accept me um and that that would that was kind of self sabotaging and damaging because i was only being used by them so i wasn't getting what i wanted in return of being accepted or anything. So, mm -hmm. you know, or again, um, what you needed. Yeah. Um, another one of the biggest ones for, especially for me is the inappropriate intense anger. Mm -hmm. um, the pattern of unstable, the uh, pattern of intense and unstable relationships, um, usually marked by extreme black and white thinking that I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier. Um, the recurrent of suicidal behavior, which that's what led me to this diagnosis was I was probably about two minutes away from not even being here today and had to be admitted in the doctor at the hospital. Like I'd never even heard of any type of personality disorders before. And he's like, listen to me talk. He's like, I know, no, I have only known you 15 minutes, but let me talk to you about borderline. So it was, pretty evident to him yeah um and then the last one is transient so uh stress related paranoia paranoia um and severe disassociative symptoms so 
which means um, you kind of disassociate from reality. Um, you create these scenarios in your head that you that are so real and intense that you actually believe them, mm -hmm. and you think that they're real. Got it. Got it. Wow. Okay, so that's a lot. Yes. That you're you're carrying, um, mm -hmm. and it kind of makes me think. Okay, now now I understand why a therapist might only take one or <laughs> two patients at a time. Um, yeah. And you know, shout out to to uh, your husband, your partners, uh, people that are helping you get through this. Yeah. Um, sounds like you have a, a lot of really good support. Is there anything that you would want to say to uh, your support network? I think he's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> you. Um, I just I'm a lover of love I love being in love and I love mm -hmm. them all like m my husband I adore his girlfriend I absolutely adore her and love her um, because again without polyamory we would have never met her and right. I would probably still be suffering honestly because uh, somebody did ask me like well what how does this work? And like, why is this okay? And I'm like, because you don't limit yourself to the experiences with people. It doesn't have to necessarily be romantic or sexual or anything else. It's your freedom to be with people and learn from them. Right. And because of polyamory, it really has led to this and a good support system. And even um, my current other partner, it's only been, a month, but he's been really, you know, supportive. He's been supportive in the way that it's finally a relationship that's like he wanted to be slow because I have a tendency to be like, let's go, let's <laughs> this is a relationship, let's go, let's dive into it, fall in love right now. And it that I guess it was always left me empty. So he's been great with teaching me, like, hey, I can slow down and nice. do this the right way. Nice. And I'll be honest, listening to your podcast, I, I've even told some of my monogamous friends, like, you should listen to this because there have been some great tips that, like, that could be used with monogamy, too, on, like, learning how to be in a relationship, really, honestly. <laughs> well, thank you for that. I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> I, I... Oh, you're right. And when you're right, you're right. And you, you're always right. <laughs> I mean, I'm not always right, but you know, the idea is just to get this information out there. And there is so much uh, about polyamory and the things that I've learned here that can absolutely apply to monogamous relationships, things that I wish I had known when I was monogamous, really, right? yes. um, that probably would have helped me out back then. So uh, two things. And then uh, one last question for you. So first of all, do you have rainbow eyeshadow? I do. That is amazing. I was supporting my Pride Month with the rainbow eyeshadow. Yes, that is freaking cool. <laughs> do you have like a like a how to video? I hope you did a how to video showing people how to do that. That looks <laughs> that looks great. I just kind of wung it, like yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. The second thing, um, I kind of want to start doing this a little bit. Tell me a little bit about everything that's back there on your wall. What is that? All that stuff back there behind you? Oh, this, this is my husband's hobby. I'm in his office. These are all of his toys. He is I love a big it. collector. He, yeah, this is his front and his drawing table because nice. he is an artist. So like, his drawing of, table with all his toys, Hot Wheels, you name it. It's in Of here. all the toys up there, which one do, would you say is his pride and joy? Ooh, that's a hard one. Mm. I don't know. Pro he, probably his Godzilla. His Actually, you can't see him, but in front of me, his pride and joys is his He-Man collection. Ooh, nice. Yeah, I don't know. Hold on, maybe. Yes. Oh, look at that. That's cool. Yes. <laughs> Man collection. And that was his thing nice. as a kid. And he's gotten me into collecting like my Care Bears and my Rainbow Bright. Like, see, my Rainbow Bright. Oh, there it is. Cute. Yes. I love it. I love it. Perfect for Pride Month. Per perfect yes. for Pride Month. Okay, the last thing that I wanted to ask you. 
uh, you said that living with bi- uh, I was about to say bipolar. Uh, living with borderline uh, and being polyamorous is not all doom and gloom. What's the message that you want to send to anybody else living with borderline and his and is also polyamorous? Um, I just want them to know that there's hope. There is treatment. There are really great treatments that are out there. The, the DPT alone, there is a workbook that you can do at home. Um, the the lady who developed di- uh, dialectical behavior treatment is also borderline. So it's, if you want to... Um, even if you don't want to talk to a therapist or anything, um, just doing that yourself, the workbook is very helpful. And I think that's the most helpful thing is learning that everything's not black and white, that everything will be okay, that things can be good and bad at the same time. Um, and that, um, I lost my thought now, but it's, there's, <laughs> That's okay. there's, there's, there's just hope. And I'm open for anybody who wants to friend request me on Facebook to talk more um, and, you know, give them links to the Amazon links to like the workbook or just, just to be an ear to listen to. Sometimes we just need somebody to vent to that's objective, you know, so Yep, yep. And uh, for anybody who's listening, because we do have listeners, uh, yeah. how can they find you if they want? Um, so right now on Facebook, I'm uh, Stacy S T A C I Gadget G A T S C H E T. Um, little side story: the reason my why my married name isn't on there is I had a borderline episode, and I was done with him, and I wasn't even going to keep his name, and so, and then. Facebook has these rules of you got to wait so long to change your name back. So yes, that, gotcha. that happens to be a product of one of my episodes. <laughs> so if you are listening anytime between now and the next, I don't know, 30 or 60 days, whatever Facebook yeah. says, uh, it's Stacy Gatchet, G A T S C H E T. Uh, mm-hmm. and that's Stacy with an I, uh, and once everything gets all fixed up, it'll be Stacy Miller again. Yes. Stacy Gadget Miller, yeah. <laughs> Stacy Gadget Miller. Cool mm-hmm. beans. All righty. Well, Stacy, thank you again, uh, as I said, so much, uh, not just for spending time with me, but uh, for being vulnerable, for being open, for um, sharing your story. Like I said, the more stories we hear, the more representation, the more people can connect. There's somebody out there who is also dealing with uh, borderline, and I hope that their story, that your story inspires them. I hope so too. And I appreciate you and what you're doing here with the podcast. It's, it's been great. Awesome. Thank you so much again. And thank you as always to our live audience for tuning in. Jeremy, thank you so much. Uh, As a reminder, when we're live, you get no commercial interruptions, but the same can't be said for those podcast downloads. So if you want to avoid the commercial interruptions, be sure to catch us live Monday through Wednesday, right here, 2.30 Pacific time, or sign up for our Patreon where you'll get access to our commercial free RSS feed and support the show. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, wherever it is that you download podcasts. And if you haven't already, please leave us a review. We'll really, really appreciate it. Thank you again, Stacy. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Until next time. Have a nice day. Thank you for tuning in to the Practicing Polyamory podcast. Would you or someone in your polycule like to be a guest? Sign up at practicingpolyamory.com and join the conversation. Please support us by subscribing, liking, and following us on social media at Practicing Polya by clicking any of the affiliate links on our website or by subscribing at patreon.com slash practicingpolya.